Hey folks, glad you could join us for our special Friday session on IPv6. That's really the topic for the day. Uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you could carve out just an hour to maybe go back over something you've probably been exposed to before. My first exposure to IPv6 was in 1999 or maybe 1998 when I was getting my MCSE back back a long time ago. And uh, so that's like 24 years ago, right? And I've seen IPv6 in a lot of different curriculum bodies and sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. And a lot of times we're left through maybe no fault of the instructors with maybe too much information. A lot of times we're actually forced into uh, a situation in curriculum based on what's going to be covered and uh, on the test. And that that means we got a lot of bulk, a lot of stuff that maybe isn't really super important for our mastery of the technology and would be bolted on easily later on. So we missed the forest for the trees. So we're going to today strip down, hence the name of the webinar, strip down IPv6 to its nuts and bolts. And we are going to stay in the nuts and bolts area. We're not going to worry about, and I'm going to show you the things we're not going to worry about. And it's a lot. And you've probably seen different components of IPv6 that are, it kind of is mind blowing or just complicates the matter. And hopefully give you a better understanding, uh, more confidence with IPv6 as we go through. Okay, so that's the goal. Okay, so we're going to have a quick discussion of some of the fundamentals that you probably have already seen if you've been in an IT course that covered IPv6. We're not going to do that ad nauseum, but I do need to make sure that everybody is squared away with the basics before we go further. Okay, so we're going to work mostly in some equipment so we can see the manifestation of the things that matter, okay? And we're gonna stop and smell the roses and we're gonna look at the little things that we could really just race through, we could miss those, and by, by missing them, sometimes we're gonna actually miss the point. And I don't wanna do that today, okay? So here's, <laughs> here's the things that I, I, I did like a really quick hey, what do we normally cover when we talk about IPv6? And it's this big list. And like the top three are what certainly you have to know just to have any kind of speaking vocabulary for IPv6. And then look at the stuff down below. Now you might look at some of those things and go, well, I like the fact that I know those things. Maybe you've gotten exposure to it before. But when I look at what it takes to build an IPv6 network, deploy it, most of the stuff that we teach, like multicast operation and the link local addresses and so much other stuff like DNS, a lot of that stuff actually is going to come up situationally, is not going to help you build an understanding. So what we're going to do is we're going to take out quite a bit of the discussion and there's like a missing fourth ingredient here. And for me, the thing that I think is way, way undertaught by at least most people who don't have a deep understanding of IPv6 is, believe it or not, a really under the hood protocol and technology for IPv6 called neighbor discovery, which is not really called out here, ND. Neighbor discovery does a lot for us in IPv6. And so if you were to know four things about IPv6 to at least just kind of warm yourself up, it would be the top three and then neighbor discovery. We are going to go beyond just talking about the length and how to read an IPv6 address, though. OK, now, wait a minute. I had made a mental note to myself. I, 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 I don't know how confident you are with IPv6. So I'm curious, on a scale of one to ten, how confident are you for IPv6? There's no right or wrong answer here, and you can certainly falsify your answer, and I'm not going to call you out. This is one of those things where I want you to see that a lot of you are probably where I would actually expect. And I would expect this even of seasoned IT 
professionals that are in the networking space. Why? Why? And that's because we don't use it very much. We use it very seldom. However, if you're coming into this presentation, you've probably heard, yeah, it is, IPv6 is out. And if you have a business grade internet connection, you probably have gotten a block of IPv6 addresses. You can use it. I'm not saying to use it, by the way, but you probably could build IPv6 connectivity to the internet right now with a business grade internet connection. And again, don't necessarily do that because that opens you up to a whole new protocol suite that you have to secure and a whole new complexity of the environment. Okay, so really great. We see some uh, integer values for the scale of one to 10, some, uh, some floating point numbers as well. Good to see. If you're out there going, I'm a zero, I'm a one, that's absolutely fine, okay? Absolutely fine, don't, don't take off, okay? It's kind of the, the point of this discussion, by the way. Cool. Yep. All right. So let's get let's get to just being able to read these because I'm going to go into the environment and we're going to spend some time in some gear deploying IPv6 addresses and seeing different things occur as we do building connectivity, maybe turning on some debug stuff like that. So the first thing that I want to make sure that we're clear on is they're fairly long. They're 128 bits, which is four times the width of an IPv4 address. So if an IPv4 address is this wide in terms of bits, which is 32 bits, we would quadruple that. So it'd be that, and then it would be about this long. So it's four times as wide, 128 bits. Now, what that means is we have a lot of numbers that we can work with. The limitation of IPv4 is we're absolutely scrounging for scraps in the IPv4 address space. And so for decades now, this protocol suite has been the intended replacement to IPv4. We are not turning on a IPv4. Nobody is talking that way. Nobody is talking about IPv4 being turned off, okay? Now, when we write these, we're gonna write them in what we call hexadecimal. And I just want you to be comfortable with the fact that each hexadecimal character represents 16 bits, or excuse me, yeah. Each hexadecimal character represents four bits and it's on a number from zero to 15. So four bits, okay? And it gives us a number range from zero to 15. But wait a minute, how do I write 15 in a single digit? How do I write 15 in a single digit? And so what we're going to do is we're going to start to roll in some letters. A is 10, F is 15. Now, let's say you're not super good with working with hex. I actually don't want you to worry about that. I just want you to accept that there are going to be some letters. You can't have a letter further than F, though, because all we're trying to do is represent 15, which F accomplishes. 16 would go to the next digit, okay? But today is not a discussion of binary to hex and things like that, because that's actually going to cloud what IPv6 really is. Hexadecimal happens with MAC addresses and a few other places as well. Okay. Now, we're also going to see that the numbers that are written as the IPv6 address, they're really, really consistently separated with these colons. Okay. So we see colons separating it out. Okay, now for the purpose of today's discussion, we're going to say that we, our organization has been given a block of IPv6 addresses, which is actually not hard to get a big block of IPv6 addresses. And we're going to have this common set of numbers, 2001, which is significant because it is the first and still only block of what we call global unicast IPv6 addresses, which just means they're public. So the public addresses all start with 2001, which is the year they began handing them out. We're still handing out this 2001 block. And then we're gonna put in Dice Cafe. And we're gonna do that so that we can uh, not worry about 
um, getting confused with what numbers are we working with and things like that. And then we're going to uh, we're going to subnet in this space. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but this is really the ID of the network. And you're going to see that a little bit during the discussion. The unique really thing that makes a different subnet unique is going to be this part. And then the rest is going to be our unique identifier on the network, which is going to be the latter 64 bits. Okay, so let's look at this address for a moment. And you can see that we've chopped it in half. Okay, so the first thing that I think a lot of people miss is the fact that yeah, and, and we've got a question, is Dice Cafe uh, something significant? No, I just chose it so that you can remember the starting 12 hexadecimal characters. Always start with 2001, that is the standard. But then each organization is gonna get a different block here, okay? So let's say I'm a coffee shop and I got handed over a big block of addresses. So that's just for today, okay? The thing that, yeah, and I thought about dead beef, right? I actually thought about it, but I wanted to be positive. Okay, or bad beef. Chop it in half. The first thing that we often miss in a discussion of IPv6 is we have a subnet mask that is actually way easier to work with than IPv4's subnet mask. What is the complexity of IPv4 in terms of subnetting? First, complexity number one is there are different classes of addresses, class A, B, and C. And then we have two different ways of representing the subnet mask, prefix notation, which this is basically derivative of that, cider slash or prefix notation. We're using the same convention, but we don't have any other convention for the, uh, we don't have any other convention. Oh, and Greg, thank you, yeah. They are handing out more. By the way, um, this is still pretty common in terms of what you're going to see in most curriculum, by the way. So, slash 64, chop it in half. So we don't have to worry about, well, how many subnets am I creating? How small is my host portion? Now, you could get fancy in a laboratory environment. And you could go with something like a slash 127, which is going to give you a perfect number of addresses between two adjacent devices. However, if you're thinking, what subnet mask do I really choose? Slash 64 is basically the mask you want to choose for any of the links that have stations. Now you could say that's super wasteful, but it's really the intent. And what that means is you don't have to worry about a lot of complex math for subnetting. You don't have to worry about uh, all of the noise for IPv4 subnetting. It's a lot easier. Now I'm not gonna say we're gonna cover subnetting in great detail, but I want you to come away from this page with one fact. An IPv6 address is really two sides. They're chopped in half. You got the left side, which tells us generally which network am I on. And on the right-hand side, what is my unique identifier? Because they absolutely need to be unique, okay? So let's see if we can just play around with this a little bit in the environment so that we get a little bit more comfort, okay? So I'm gonna keep the topology pretty straightforward today. I've got a larger topology. We're using our Cisco, uh, Cisco Sandbox Lab for this. But we're going to keep it mostly centered around R1 connecting to ISP A. And we have a question, is there a private address space for IPv6? Interestingly, the answer to that has changed. At first, there was a private address space, and then they deprecated it, and they came up with a different private address space because they realized, well, wait a minute, not everything should be um, not everything should be uh, public. 
but I still might have connectivity. We're not going to get into that. Uh, we're not going to get into that. But the answer is yes, there is a form of a private address. Okay. So today, let's build, let's build a first an address that maybe we'll get test connectivity to later on. Okay. And uh, Vincent, you can still get broadcast storms on IPv6 because broadcast storms are a function of Ethernet and would happen independently. Okay. So, yeah, absolutely. Because broadcast storms are also going to happen for multicast as well. So no, this does not get rid of broadcast storms. Okay. So we're going to go in and we're going to build a loopback interface. Right now, we're going to go here and I'm going to say IPv6 address. Okay. So IPv6 address and I'll hit question mark. And at first we're going to be like, oh no, this is, this looks really, really messy. This looks like a lot of detail, but what we're going to do is we're going to assign an address and I want you to see that, yeah, we can assign it and it's going to be separated out with colons. But what's a little unusual at first is we might think to ourselves, uh, you know, I'm expecting this to be longer. Why isn't it telling me 32 hexadecimal characters? Because that's what the math would be. If each hex character is four bits, it takes 32 of them to represent 128 bits. There's something else going on here. The syntax is reflective of this, and this is how it works for any operating system, by the way. I happen to be in Cisco, which is one place you would work with these, but the same would be true if you did an IP config slash all in a Windows box, or if you saw it by looking at an interface in a Linux environment, okay? So let's go back and get a little bit more exposure to something we have to come to terms with because we already have seen that we're missing something. And the thing that we're missing is the fact that we can drop off leading zeros. In totality, we need 32 hexadecimal characters. However, you don't need the leading zeros. Okay, so that's the first part of this. So uh, a long time ago, instructors started calling these groupings quartets, okay, which is actually didn't make some of the IPv6 designers super happy, in my opinion, because they're a little too finicky. But we're going to call these quartets, okay, groups of four. And in any quartet you want, you can drop off up to three leading zeros. And so we can see that rule being used here, okay? If I tell you how much money I made at a garage sale, and let's say I'm like, yeah, I made like four figures of dollars in my garage sale. And you're like, all right, how much money do you make? And you say, I made zero, zero, five dollars. That isn't really a faithful representation. I don't, as a human being, always need to talk leading zeros. And so we drop off leading zeros. Okay, kind of a no big deal sort of thing. And then we have this double colon. And the double colon is usable once because it's actually variable. So it could substitute an entire one quartet or two or uh, seven quartets or even eight. Okay, or even eight. And so this is the proper shortening of an IPv6 address. So all we need to do is we need to get a little bit more comfortable the fact, fact that zeros that begin a quartet can be dropped. And if you got a big grouping of zeros, you don't need to have that as well. So let's apply this to our environment to make sure that we're comfortable with it, okay? So I'm going to, for today, say 2001, and we're going to do Dice Cafe for all of our addresses. 
And then we'll do D, 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 D. There'll be a network. And we'll say that. Okay. So let's break that up. I've used the double colon substitution rule to do what? What did what part of the address was most of and we are going to talk about that WT. Yeah, we're going to talk about colon colon slash zero. That would be a default route. So And we are going to lead with 2001. Cool. So what we're saying is this is the address block that's allocated to our company. The unique identifier for the network space for this one, I've just chosen, and I have, I have four hexadecimal characters to work with. So in this space, theoretically, I can do this all day long because there's 65,536 networks that I can still uniquely identify. This is a two to the 16 power. You might go, I don't, I don't see where you're getting two to the 16. If you were to just think in terms of counting zero, 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 one, and then two, we could roll through 65,000 combinations in this space. So I have plenty of networks to work with, plenty of networks to work with, and there is an abundance. So if I actually needed another address block, it wouldn't be painful like it is for IPv4. Okay. So the unique identifier on the host portion is just one. It's, it's 15 zeros, which we've dropped off, and a one. And let's just make sure we can ping that. I'm going to just use the standard tools. Now, wait a minute. Why did it give me an error? Why did it give me an error? Is it because what we're learning isn't true or did I make a typo? Let's learn from my typo. I missed a colon, right. So what I could have done, there are two ways that I could have resolved this. I could have said colon, colon one, or, <laughs> uh, or, We'll do this. Is that right? Yeah, that looks about right. Same thing. So it'll take it in either way, okay? It'll take it either way. Good, good stuff. And Jesse says, so written out. Yep, yep, just, just, what, just what we had there. Awesome stuff. Okay, cool. So IPv6 addresses all do work like we're saying they work, okay? They can be shortened. And just so we're clear, yeah, and Jeff, the entirety of each of the quartets that you're substituting has to be zeros, okay? And you can't like bridge any two quartets that are have some non-zero values. So really what you're doing is you're looking for what is the widest space that I can pluck out that's all zeros that is bounded by the colons? What's the widest place? And I can only do that once, okay? And some tests are gonna ask you questions on that. You might see that in some rudimentary tests nowadays, but usually test questions in CompTIA and Cisco are actually way harder, and <laughs> sometimes way harder than they need to be. Like CompTIA's eight, uh, Network Plus IPv6 questions are like, whoa, we don't even teach this in Cisco. Okay, so cool. So we kind of already talked about this, you know, we kind of already talked about this. Let's just make sure that we get a little bit of 
reaffirmation of what we've seen now. I'm going to generally be using a slash 64 mask. Now, you know, it, once you know the way to do it, you can know the way to break it. And for somebody who's like, well, I'm just going to use one slash 127 or slash 128. Yeah, you can. And a 127 would be great for point to point links. 128 would be great for just giving out one IP address to something to hang on to maybe a virtual interface. But if you're deploying, it's good to just have confidence with what you're starting with. IPv4 doesn't have this. The closest thing in IPv4 is use slash 24 mass, but you know what? There's a lot of choices into even can you use a slash 24 mass. Here, it's much more consistent, okay? Okay, Marlene's got a great question. Let's talk about that. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna be demoing exactly what Marlene's asking. The first thing is us. We often get somewhere around a block that is allocated to us saying, you start with these numbers. In this case, if you're allocated a slash 48, start and you, you've you got this place to work within. And so you got to keep the first 48 bits if you're allocated a site prefix that way. Now, by the way, your mileage may vary. You might get a different one. I've gotten like the most recent block I got was a slash 56, which isn't what we teach. Okay, no big deal. So then, here's the deal, Marlene. We need probably a bunch of IPv6 networks if we get one block of addresses. So a block of addresses, a block of address comes from your service provider, but it really comes from the numbers authority that gives blocks to your service providers. You get a, a, a block of IPs from your service provider, but what you need in order to deploy that is probably a number of discrete different subnetworks. The concept is still true. We still have subnetting. So what we need is we need to think, well, every VLAN that is gonna be IPv6 enabled, every VLAN would need its own IPv6 subnet. Every link between routers would need its own subnet. And so I'd want you thinking, I probably need somewhere between 50 and 500 unique networks for a site, okay? And a small site might only be like 10, okay? But Marlene, I chose to create a new unique network preserving the first 48 bits. So that's what I was allocated. I can do that, okay? I'm, as long as I keep the first 12 hexadecimal characters the same, I can do that. And then I can choose anything that I haven't used elsewhere in this space. So I literally can do anything here, but apply it just once, okay? So once I assigned D, 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 now it's cooked. It's baked on the router that I assigned it to and anything that happened to be connected up to that same link, okay? Cool. So I just chose it at random. I just needed a new number. So if you're thinking, why didn't I just choose two? Well, we're going to do some kind of progression if we get there. And I don't want to have to worry about running into something again. Okay. Uh, and yes, there is a sense of public private. We're mostly going to be talking about the main form of public address. This is technically called a global unicast address. Global unicast address, you really only need to know two kinds of addresses for IPv6. There are others. Multicast addresses, uh, site local. But what we're going to worry about is two. The only two that matter. Global unicast, which is this, okay? 
and link local. We're going to see both. Yeah, you don't need uh, you don't need to have. It's absolutely true. You don't need to have. Uh, global unicast between routers for simplicity and traceability. If you want to be able to ping it, though, let's say you wanted to do a trace route to an uh, intermediate router, and we don't have to worry about running out of addresses, and we don't want to, we don't have to worry about getting scanned because we have a global address. Okay, there's a lot going on. What have we seen? We've seen I have addressed one device. Okay, I can ping it from a local device. And I did this, I'll scroll up, on what we'd call a loopback interface, which is just a virtual interface. Okay, but let's get connectivity between two different devices. Okay, so R1 is directly connected over to ISPA. And if you're keen on Cisco, you would be able to decode this, but I'll just tell you, okay? R1 connects up to a different router. So router one talking to ISPA. We can think of it as like a, just another router, okay? And we can see the interfaces. This is my R1 interface that goes to the other device, okay? So let's just make sure I didn't pre-cook anything. And I've, you know, been on doing some IPv6 stuff on this, so it's also for me. Show IPv6 interface proof. So we're gonna make sure that we don't have any IPv6 connectivity between these devices. Okay, so I don't have any IPv6 uh, interfaces except for the one that I just brought up during the session already, okay? So let's go back. And address between these two. <laughs> yeah. Link layer discovery protocol is cool too, but CDP is on by default. And these have got like a really just vanilla config. There's not anything super fancy here. Okay, so we're gonna build a new IPv6 link between two routers. So we're talking, this is a, this is a link. And by the way, the term link is significant for IPv6. It is the replacement for the term broadcast domain, partially because broadcast domain is a layer two construct and they did away with layer three broadcasts. We still can have layer two broadcasts though, okay? So we're gonna do IPv6 address. And then what are we to do here? We're gonna say, this is the, this is the stuff that I can work with. And I, I can choose anything for my next four characters. My next four characters can be anything, but once I choose it, it has to be agreed upon with the ISP router, okay? So we're gonna have to share the first, ultimately 16 hexadecimal characters. That's what we're gonna do. Now, one of the conventions that I like to do is I actually like to, sometimes identify the devices that are on the link. And for me, sometimes I do that by assigning a number to a device. Like I'll say R1 is one and ISP A is nine. It really doesn't matter. I could choose anything. I'm not trying to build summarizable Okay, we're going to do that. And wait a minute. Let's let's look at our interfaces for a moment. 
look at our interfaces before still in R1. I haven't done this yet for for ISPA. This was the before. There was nothing there. And I'm going to reshow that command, do show IPv6 and brief. And now we get to park on what just happened there. I got some garbage. I got some stuff that I didn't put in. What's going on here? Okay. Well, first, let's just make sure that We've got the address that we did assign, okay? We've got the address that we did assign. It looks okay, fine. I'm sure they're not rewriting my address. But I'm getting this, okay? Now, one of the things that I would say, once you built an understanding of IPv6, this functionality is quite important. And it's called link local, okay? This link local address and you can recognize any link local address because they always begin always begin fe80 all fe80 addresses are uh, born out of this it's a flavor of private but it's so private it's non-routable also it's closest in uh, functionality to what we would call a pipa addresses in ipv4 that's automatic private IP assignment, okay? And Matthew's saying, that's not garbage. No, it isn't. Because a lot of the underhood of the communication that happens for IPv6, in fact, uses this. Most of the internal signaling doesn't use the global addresses. So that's something that spawned out of thin air, but it enables a lot of the other mechanisms, the most important mechanisms, believe it or not. And routing protocols use and communicate using those addresses too. So what is this? This is a, a, a non-routable address that was self-assigned that enables communication with any direct link. So you're not gonna build a web server and point to this, but for communication to any adjacent devices, link local is the way it goes, okay? So, yeah, and thanks for chatting in the APIPA range. Okay. We don't have a uh, side to communicate with on ISPA, though. And uh, so the question is, is an alternative broadcast technically, Jeff, when people say the alternative to broadcast, the alternative to broadcast is multicast communication, okay? So I would say no, if we're trying to help you build an understanding, no. This is instead the alternative to, well, here's a different way of thinking. This enables you to operate and communicate with adjacent devices without any manually assigned addresses. And so isn't it great to be able to talk to your neighbors if you're in a partial state of config? And the answer is yes, it's good, okay. Uh, got a question, how does link local address propagate from a router to an endpoint node? It doesn't. Um, so it's self-assigned first and it's self-assigned and validated for uniqueness with the protocol we will look at today called neighbor discovery protocol. So you assign one, but before you assign it, neighbor discovery protocol does validate that it's unique, okay? Yep, and there is no implied subnet because it can't be routed. It cannot be routed, okay. Cool questions. So we're going to go to the opposite side. Now, ISPA has kind of a funky interface that is married to this. Just trust me when I say this is a layer three interface that goes over to R1. Um, and it's because there's a bridged interface on the ISP. Don't worry about the interface type is that part of it. So I am going to sign 
an address. Absolutely possible for me to typo it. We need address, right? Okay. Yeah, um, link local would allow you to communicate with any host on your LAN, a hundred percent. It's not just uh, it's not just network devices. So if you're dual stacked, even without an address, link local is on. And it's partially derived from your MAC address. That's one of the ways that a lot of operating systems uh, build uniqueness. So we're going to ping that address. OK. This is. You could you could see this and be underwhelmed, okay? <laughs> and that's this is a big deal, okay? Now I'm not saying we've built an entire internet work yet, but we've built the thing that internet works need. Step one is layer three connectivity between two two different devices. So uh, Jesse asked me to do this command. OK, you know what? This is a big deal, too. And it doesn't look like it's a big deal, but it is. So first, I can ping the other side. I mean, that's the magic of networking, getting one thing to talking to another. And sometimes you need like a dynamic routing protocol to work through those, OK? And oh yeah, let's um let's change it up. Thanks, and we'll do that. Do that again, so you can see. That was my address that I assigned. Forgot which view I was in. Okay, thank you. And so what's going on here? This is the thing that is easily missed. This is a stop and smell the roses moment. This is the result of neighbor discovery. And I and I mean ND. ND is a protocol. And a super crucial protocol for IPv6. Now, I want you to think about IPv4 for a moment, just for a moment. You've heard of address resolution protocol for IPv4. And under the hood for IPv4, ARP is a really, really big deal. We don't have ARP anymore. Instead, we've got this kind of catch-all protocol. <laughs> it does a lot for us. And it's more than you would think, OK? It is more than you would think. So neighbor discovery protocol takes on the responsibility of ARP, but I'm going to show you it does more than that. So what are we looking at, by the way? What we're looking at is, from an OSI model perspective, in order to get to these addresses, I will use at layer 2, I will encapsulate at layer 2, the destination MAC address that is shown here. This is stuff that has to be resolved. You aren't born knowing this IPv6 address maps to this MAC address. So neighbor discovery protocol populated it, just like ARP would populate this if I had done some communication for IPv4. OK? Yeah, so there is no, as Jesse is indicating. No, no, can't do it. Doesn't exist. ARP doesn't exist off of IPv6, OK? All right, beautiful. I love like the direction with uh, doing the show commands, too. Let's, um, let's look at the routing table for a moment. 
So I'm going to look at the routing table and okay, I see some routes. Nothing really interesting. And if you're looking, well, wait a minute, this looks pretty foreign to me. Here's the deal. A connected route just teaches you how to get something that you're plugged into, which is not going to build an internet work. And this is a, uh, another kind of route that basically just points to a single IP address that's hanging off. Okay. And Will is at, or um, Vincent is asking, can we communicate via these FE80 addresses? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's do that. Just so you, you've seen it. So right now, though, we don't have routes. All we have is just two things that can that can talk in some manner. I'm not quite sure if routing is operational. It probably isn't. Okay. Uh, it's brief. Okay, so the question was, am I going to be able to communicate via these? So let's prove it. We're going to ping FE80 colon colon 42462B. I know you can copy and paste, but sometimes in a virtual environment, copying and pasting can be a little sloppy. Oh, yeah, output interface. So here's the thing. This is an address that is not self-evident directionality-wise. It doesn't necessarily know which interface it's hanging off of. So unlike most pings, I do have to identify the egress interface. So we're going to do that. How did I typo it? I would expect this to work, by the way. FE80 colon colon 462B3FF. Nope, I typoed it. Did somebody catch that? FE3E. F E three E. Sorry for the. I, this is definitely you should have copied and pasted it, right? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so that was a little messy, but we got there. We can ping between these devices, so they absolutely can talk. It's a fully functioning address, but it's not routable. I mean, honestly, I grew up on non-routable protocols in the 80s and 90s. We had like, we had a whole protocol suites like NetBuoy, which we couldn't route, and earlier versions of Apple Talk couldn't route. So, you want to talk to something on your device? Use this. Cool. All right. So, what have we seen? We've seen. Two devices able to communicate with each other. Saw so some of the byproduct of enabling. So the, the deal is we get FE80 and other link local addresses just by having an operational interface plugged into the TCP IP v6 suite. Okay. So yeah, Jeff is remembering net and buoy and um sure banyan vines and stuff like that too. All right, let's go back to the routing table, and we're going to look at the V6 routing table. So, wait a minute. I What would be really interesting is if I could ping, ping 2001, I could ping this address, okay? That's what I want to get to. That's I want to be able to get so I can ping this address. Now let's understand why that's significant. Now first, this is on a different network. 
So we had actually a little bit more of a discussion on networking and different subnets than I had anticipated, but this is this is it's significant. R1 has a network. It, I asked it to reach it, but the table that facilitates that, which is the routing table, doesn't have a way to get there. So I, I need a route. Okay, I need a route. What are the ways that I could do this? It's actually more than you would think. Okay, there's a lot of ways that I could do this. Uh, and Jesse's saying enable IPv6 routing. Okay. That is actually way more insightful than you might realize. Okay. IPv6 unicast routing. IPv6 unicast routing. Uh, routing wasn't on. Okay. So that's the first part of it. Routing wasn't on. I'm going to go back and redo that show command. Okay. Routing wasn't on. That's interesting. So one way I can do that. Let's do it the weirdest way that I can possibly think of. I am going to use neighbor discovery protocol to be my dynamic routing protocol. <laughs> Let's give this a try, see if it works. It's certainly not going to be the way that we would do it in the real world. But neighbor discovery protocol actually is more than just ARP. It can also operate as a dynamic routing protocol. And let's make sure we've got this on the right link. I'm not going to battle this one. Don't suppress it. Yeah. Let's just go straight up there. Yeah. You know, CCNA is one of those things that is great to show you. A little surprised the neighbor discovery protocol didn't work, but that's okay. Because really what we want to see here is a static route. And no, I shouldn't need to enable uh, neighbor discovery protocol on both sides. It's probable that I've got That actually looks good. Okay. But let's go back to what actually matters for our understanding, which is in this case, no neighbor discovery protocol is the ARP substitute. What, what I was working to lead you up to is we're trying to build networking. We're trying to build connectivity. So one of the questions that came in early on was, could you have colon, colon, by the way, colon, colon, one, you wouldn't build a route to this, colon, colon, one is the loopback, but could you have colon, colon, zero? And the answer is 100%, I said zero, but I typed in eight for some reason. Okay, colon, colon, zero. Let's park on that for a moment because it's really odd to look at it for the first time. If that looks strange to you, I've felt your pain, okay? So this is equivalent to what we normally, a lot of times call a quad zeros in IPv4. It's a default route. And it's basically nothing for the address and as non-specific a mask as possible. So it's totally valid. It is 100% valid 
and would help us. And if this were our internet connection, I could do it this way. And yeah, let's give that a try. So what do I do here? Now I had a question. Could you build connectivity off of link local addresses? Can you build connectivity off of link local addresses? And the answer is absolutely. Okay. So I could either choose to put in a link local address, okay, or I could put in the global unicast. If I put in the global unicast address, I wouldn't have had to do this step, okay? Link local doesn't tell us which interface it's going to be out of, okay? So really, I have one of two different options, and I'm going to do the one that's going to be just easiest to work with. So what we were trying to do, oh, that's not the right address, though. Absolutely not the right address. Oh, no, it is. Sorry, I was thinking that that was the one that I had mapped to the loopback interface. No, nope, that's fine. That's a connected subnet. So I'm going to put that back in. This should allow me to ping. Should allow me to ping this address right here. Yeah. And thanks for the correction. Just a slight typo that I've corrected. Cool. Appreciate that so much. Okay. That may not look great to you, but that successful ping for IPv6 meant that routing is actually operational. Thanks for the feedback, by the way. Whole class on this stuff. Yeah, more than just an hour carved out. Let's look at the routing table. Uh, IPv6 route. We built a default static route. Now, by doing so, I bridge the gap between two devices. Now, you could think to yourself, what can I do with this knowledge, right? What could I do with this knowledge? Well, the reality is, there's a lot of different dynamic routing protocols that exist for IPv6, RIP, Next Generation or v6, OSPF v3, Border Gateway Protocol, EIGRP. Believe it or not, building connectivity once you've gotten to that point is not is not the hard part. OSPF v3 is actually very very straightforward. It works like v2, and so step one is building on something that has provided you connectivity. And so that's what we've tried to do today. Give you a little bit more confident with the addresses, get a little bit more comfortable with it so that you can go, okay, so I just inherited maybe this block of IPv6 addresses. What does it even mean? And I'm saying, by the way, don't go out and do this in the wild if you don't need to. But we're gonna be called upon sometime in our career to work with IPv6. When I learned it in the first time, the first time in the 90s, people were like, yeah, it's coming. <laughs> when is it coming? We don't know. It's still kind of that way, but ISPs work with it. Telco providers are deeply invested in it. Mobile carriers are deeply invested in it as well. And it is an enabler, I, I think most importantly for telco and mobile providers, just because it doesn't cost them 
huge exorbitant amounts of money to address all of the smartphones that we have. So it's a really nice thing, okay? So that that's the main point. Cell phones and IoT, <laughs> although I wouldn't put IoT on this if I didn't have to. Okay. Folks, hopefully you got a little bit better on understanding on IPv6 today in the hour that we spent together. Thanks, by the way, for spending an hour with us. Uh, if you haven't seen Stormwind before, this is a slice out of a live experience that we do. Uh, we've got a lot of classes, well over 250. We had a lot of things, networking, cybersecurity, cloud project management, uh, server administration, Microsoft, Linux, that sort of thing, artificial intelligence. If this experience is conducive to your learning style, or if you wanted to watch the recording and that works for you too, uh, definitely I would encourage you to reach out. And that would be true for somebody in your proximity too. Maybe you're a manager, you want some people to get trained on your team. You can reach out to Mike Fajan. He's a top sales rep on the floor and he's you know, he's waiting for your call. So don't hesitate to shoot him an email, ask questions. I would also encourage you to go to our website at stormwindstudios.com and you can see a lot of different classes. So if you're like, uh, you know, I don't need IPv6 in my world. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But I need something X else. I would encourage you to take a look. We've got a lot of classes out there and a lot of certification classes, a lot of real world classes and laboratories and practice exams to boot. I was in our one of our Cisco labs during the demonstration the whole time. Okay, hey, <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, I hope each and every one of you have a, a great weekend. By the way, before I wrap up too officially, next week, Raymond is gonna be doing another one of these stripped down webinars. And if you liked this, try to get yourself into that. We, we don't block people from trying to get in. And he's gonna do it on border gateway protocol, which is another one of those things that's like maybe you don't work with BGP every day, but it always is like way too complicated than it needs to be. Raymond's doing another one of stripped down webinars. Uh, try to get yourself in if you've got the time. So with that, uh, thanks so much for your attendance and participation. I love the chats. They helped me too when I was figuring out typos and a few like cool show commands too. All right, folks, have a great one. Thanks for your time. Look to see you in another event with us soon.